we're going to talk today about, we, we've looked at the truth of the scripture and how important that is for us to, to come to not only just an understanding, but a, but a what do I do? You ain't done nothing. It's, it's chairs. That's a rocker. Oh, sorry. Uh, Here. That's all right. Now you're correct. Here, ain't calling enough for that. Uh, anyway, we talked about the truth of the scripture, and that's the foundation. Because everything that we believe and and need to hold on to is is grounded in scripture. That's it's not just the word of somebody or some preacher or, or, or some book we've read. It's, it's in the scripture. If we can't, if we can't grasp these important uh, uh, subjects through scripture, then that's just so much novel. We need to, we need to get back to what's the truth. So we've, we've gone through that foundation. And, and, and last week we talked about having the assurance of salvation. Now, today, we're going to talk about eternal security. Well, just I just want you to think about that in terms of what's secure. Well, your house. You have locks on your doors. You have now then doorbell ringer things that you can see people out there that, that, that some people will talk to you as you're trying to enter the building and you don't even know they're there. You do realize, everybody, that these doors now have cameras on them. That's not just recording what's coming in. They they know when you're coming. They get alerted, and they can talk to you as you're unlocking the door. It scares the life. And it does. It does. He had somebody talking to him. Where is that voice coming from? I'm standing here, but he's talking still. And he's saying, I lost my mind because I heard your voice. Yes. Yeah, but he was answering his name. Jim, what are you doing? Whoa. Security. But it's all in the name of security. To have us to have this peace about our salvation, there is an eternal security. Well, what is that security? Is it a doorbell ringer? Is it a is it a scripture? Is it a is it a what gives us that peace of mind? And this is probably what the third security system we've had in this church over the years. At least that. Why three? Well, we had car wrecks out here. We've been robbed before. We've had break-ins before. So we put in various kinds of things. Well, what's the most basic? We looked at a picture of it last night, I think. The basic kind, how many of you remember the old ring and the, and the, and the hook that went in it, and that was the security of your screen door at night, and you didn't have to worry about anything so nobody could get in because that was secure? No, that isn't secure. You know that. I know that. But we didn't used to worry about that. Didn't even lock doors. If they had it locks on. So we 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 have we know a lot about trying to make ourselves secure. Last week we talked about the assurance of our salvation, the surety of it. We can be positive about salvation. Today we're talking about the eternal aspect of that salvation, and eternal means forever. This is one of those subjects that, as uh, I was saved when I was young, it had no bearing on me. I had no real comprehension about the security of the believer when I was young. Because life, I thought life was just what I was experiencing then, and it would go on forever. Well, of course, you get a little bit older and figure out you experience death in families, death in friendships. You experience death on the news. You experience, you, you begin to see that, wait a minute, this is just temporal. What I'm, what I'm on right now could end. And then eventually you get to the realization it will end. It not could end, it will end. And so 
What goes beyond that? Well, the pastor get up and tell you, said, well, your 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 salvation is for eternity. Beyond this death, well, okay, I'm supposed to, 9, 10, 12 years old, I'm supposed to understand that? No. As you grow, you begin to look through life's experiences. As we have these things happen to us, we lose family members, we lose friends, accidents happen, wars happen, things happen that you see temporal life in, what is this thing of eternal security? How can I know for sure that I will have life with Christ beyond temporal grave? We're going to, we're going to talk about that today because that's one of these fundamental things that every Christian ought to grant it. This eight or nine year old that, that goes down here and gets baptized that may be a true believer. I'm not going to take that away from a childhood belief. I, 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 I agree with that and can accept it, but they're not going to understand this concept because their life hasn't experienced that yet. But they will. But for us in here, this is something we ought to be able to just hang our hat on. I'm eternally secure. Well, how do I know that? So let's take a look at that today. We're going to look at a lot of scripture. I've decided to do something, and I didn't get it done for today. I'm not making notes for these to hand out for copies of these charts. But I am going to make you a list, I think, of all of the scripture that we would be using for each session. So that for eternal security, I'll have you a list of scriptures that you'll have. For, for assurance of salvation, I'll make you a list of scriptures that we used that we'll go back to uh, to do that, some of that. So let's take a look. And, uh, and our first thing we're going to look at is uh, we're going to look at, at John 10, 27, and 29, through 29. And in that uh, 10th chapter, follow along, John 10, 27 to 29. Let's see what the scripture has to say to say about that. And I'll start with the 25th verse because this is all this is all uh, uh, Jesus answering a question that's been posed to him. And Jesus answers them, "I told you, and uh, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. But do not believe." because you are not my sheep, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Now, starting this verse, that's, that leads up to the, to the key verse here. He's telling these people that are asking them uh, outside the temple, they're asking him about who he is and what he's doing, and he says, I, I've told you, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Now, that's a critical little passage right there. Because you are not my sheep. Now, here's the focal point. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Going on to the 29th verse. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. 30th verse, to wrap it up, I and the Father are one. Now what he's describing there is, you, you've witnessed the, the passages of Scripture, you've witnessed talking to these people, you've witnessed the miracles of healing, even the miracles of raising some from the dead, You've witnessed, uh, you've witnessed a feeding of thousands where you had virtually nothing to start with. You, you've seen all of these, these evidences of the power of God vested in me, given to you. This is Jesus speaking here. And you've not accepted it. You've not, you've not believed in me. And 
And so you need to understand, you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. You don't follow me. You don't hear what I've been trying to tell you and show you <coughs> and prove to you over the last three years thereabouts. So he's, he's, you're not my sheep. So that tells us one thing very critical about this is that there are believers and there are non-believers all in the presence of Christ, all having seen, seen the same kinds of, of miracles and heard the same kind of testimony. Some believed, some did not. Those that did not are not following Christ because they don't hear his voice. They've heard it, but they're not going to obey it. They're not going to believe it. <coughs> so by not believing, they don't follow him. They hear my voice, and they follow me. Then he goes on to say this critical little, little passage in here. My short the sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. Now, if you took that just on the literal face, <coughs> they knew sheep. These people knew sheep. They brought sheep annually to the temple to be sacrificed. That was the Jewish law of the Old Testament. There was a sacrifice required for sin. And, and they understood, and, and that meant something had to die. And to them, to many of them, sheep were valuable. That was costly to sacrifice a sheep for their sin. And so I give them I give my sheep, his followers, eternal life. Well, eternal life would mean you didn't die. But here's where he's talking in a, in a spiritual sense. Because look what he says. Look what he says. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. I can't help but go back to Job. In the beginning of the book of Job in the Old Testament, which Job probably is one of the first books of the Bible, that was the first one that was written, what does God say? The devil was going to and fro of the earth, and he approached God and said, to, "You know, just just let me have one of your one of your people, and and uh, and I'll pull them or snatch them away." And God says, "Well, have you considered have you considered my servant Job?" This is Jim translating this in a, in a hurriedly paraphrase. Okay, I have you considered my servant Job? Servant in the context of believer. My servant Job. Here he is. I'm going to throw it. Here he is. Have you considered him? <clears throat> you can do anything to him you want to this point. And God's in control of this now. He's got Job literally in his hand. He's got the spirit of Job in his hand. And Satan goes out and he takes his family away from him. He takes all of his possessions away from him. Uh, he takes all of his, all of his uh, slaves away from him. All, all of his servants away from him. He takes, takes his land away from him. And still Job, when, when, when hit with all of that, Satan comes back and he won't deny, he won't deny God. And God says, Well, I can't do this with that box. And God says, Well, I'll let you take all of his possessions away from you. You can test him with his health. You cannot kill him. 
but you can hurt him. And God releases a portion, one more handhold, loosens that, and Satan goes in and puts boils on him, and he, and he causes him to suffer greatly, and, the, and, it's, and it's, it's horrible with, with what he's got. But that picture is the picture I want you to get out of this. That when we surrender our lives to Christ, when we come believers that hear, listen, and respond to and obey the Master, we have to understand the Master now has us in His hand. What's secure in His hand cannot be kicked in by the robber, cannot be encroached. Satan can't wiggle his way in and take it away. He is in control. What is secure in Christ's hand, because Christ, what did he say? Jesus said, my Father and I are one. What God has latched on to Satan can't take out of his hand. No more than he can take Job out of his hand. He can only do to Job what God said, have you considered this? Have you considered this, you know? And, and, and he's still got Job in his hand. And then he, and Job doesn't relent. Doesn't, Job doesn't curse God. Job doesn't, doesn't fail in his belief. In that, is the security we're talking about. It's not about eternal life. It's eternal security. Eternal life doesn't begin... I'm going to say this and I'm wrong. Eternal life begins at the time of salvation because we become Christ. Too many times we think of it as eternal life starts after I'm dead. I have to have temporal death before I can have eternal life. No. No. Eternal life begins with belief in Christ. That security happens now. So in this in this room, all of us are, are believers in Christ. We're all eternally secure now, right now. Now, I'm going to tell you, don't always believe that. I uh, always struggle with that some, and there's going to be times uh, that, it's, uh, that it's going to be challenging because life is going to, the devil's going to come at us. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to suffer. We're going to, we're going to be challenged. We're going to be tested. We're certainly going to be tempted. We'll talk about some of those topics later on, but, but the idea is this third thing that we, we need to know, know without a shadow of a doubt, that even in those times, we have eternal salvation. We have eternity with God secure. So there is... There is a security. You cannot lose your salvation. Better being saved, knowing that assurance that you're saved. We talked about that last week. How about standing on the assurance and knowing that you can never lose your salvation? Now, there are entire denominations that are built around, you can be saved today, you can sin, you'll lose your salvation, you got to start over. There are places. There are places you're going to go that people would want to teach you that you have to uh, you have to be baptized again. That you have to start over. You can lose your salvation. Here's the premise. If that was the case, Christ would have to be would have to be crucified a second time or a third time or a fourth time, or every time. He shed his blood once for all. 
and that's one time for all my sins. Now, that doesn't mean, I'm going to run through this, that doesn't mean he's not going to take you to the woodshed. That doesn't mean that we can, we can go and do whatever we want to. It means he now possesses us. We truly believe he now possesses us. We are his possession. And so with that comes the responsibility not only to act like it, to believe it, to witness it, to share it, uh, but to feel assured of it, to be confident in it. So let's, I'm going to run through some stuff. I'm going to run through pretty fast. We won't read all of the scripture. Um, I will give it to you later. Uh, I'm interested in your questions, but uh, just know that this is a, this is a, like I said, it's not a denominational thing. But we as Baptists believe in eternal security of the believer, and we do that because that's what the Scripture says. We, we say that we are people of the Word. So that goes back to the very first lesson. What do you believe about the Bible? Is it God's Word? If it's truth, then we ought to believe it, if that's what we're standing on, and it is. So what does the Bible say about eternal salvation? Don't go to a doctrinal thing because there are, there are some very good people going to a lot of pretty nice churches that will say they can lose their salvation. You either had it or you never had it. You don't have it and lose it and have it and lose it. You either have it or you never had it. All right. So, Let's look at some reasons why we can believe that. First thing is, uh, when, we're, uh, when we're saved, we're inducted into, we have a spiritual aspect of it, we're inducted into uh, the family of God. And I'm just going to ask the question, what would be the impact on your spiritual life if being a part of that family was subject to a daily checklist? You're in and out on any given day. That is not the way our families are. Think about it. As a child, what would you do if every day, okay, we're going to have a reckoning today, and you had to go sit toward your father and your mother, and they said, well, you were kind of bad today. Now you're not in the family. You can leave. Two or three days later, you come back and say, I'm sorry. Well, okay. We'll try this over. No. No. I had to do something with our son that this Christian psychologist asked us to do. Um, he, was kind of, he was kind of rebellious. And so we went through a summer of every day having a meeting. We had to evaluate, how, how was your attitude today? How was your reactions today? That kind of thing. And I'm just summing this up real quickly, but the idea is we, he went, his relationship to the family wasn't in jeopardy. But whether or not he was going to get to play football the next year at school was. If he didn't straighten up his act and, and, and do some things. And so we, we devised a point system. And he would assign himself, well, I, you know, if I did real good, I'd get five points. If I did, you know, I cracked a little bit, stuff, but it did okay, I might get three or four. Or if I just flat through a fit and broke something and said bad things to mom or whatever, it was zero. So that daily thing, he could see the pattern. And it didn't take long for him to figure out what he would have to do. Well, think about that if you... If, if you went through something like that every day and it would matter whether or not you could be a part of the family or not. God doesn't like that. He's not like that. That's not, the, that's not it. There's a spiritual issue here. We're in God's family. We're a child of God. Does that mean he didn't get, he didn't get, he didn't get uh, disciplined when he was bad for whatever that bad action was? No. Do we get disciplined? Yes. As children of God, we get disciplined. I do not want to go 
to God's good part. Why not? We'll see a passage of scripture that tells us that. But we will go. So there's a spiritual health to being to being a part of that family, that to know with assurance that regardless of what I do, I have a family. It's important for our children. It was important for us as kids. It's important for the for the generations to come. Spiritual productivity. When we know the future is secure, we can concentrate on the present. I'm, a little story. Golden Great Bridge was built in 1937, I think. You can fact check this later. And they started off, and everybody knows the Golden Great Bridge, a great expanse. It was one of the longest suspension bridges being built at the time, all that kind of stuff. Well, they lost 23 workers as they were starting to build this thing because they fell into the bay. When they fell, they were dead. You know, the length of the fall, the, the icy waters, and all that stuff, the, the, the cold waters, the situation. And and they were lagging behind in their production. They were uh, they were concerned about it. So uh, they got together and said, what should we do? So they, they spent $100,000, 1937, that was a lot of money, and built a safety net under the area where the workers were extending the bridge out. That safety net allowed them to work faster, to work with more confidence, to work ahead, and as a result of that investment of $100,000, they finished the job ahead of contract, under budget, and 10 people had fallen into the net, and none of them died. Just knowing there was a safety net there. And the idea of having something like that. Well, let's keep that in mind when you think of something like spiritual productivity. When we know the future is secure, then we can concentrate on the present. When I know that my every action is not going to, to, re, to uh, result in a, uh, an elimination from the family, I can concentrate on what I need to do, and that's being obedient to God and being productive for God. So, so there's a there's a spiritual reason for that, for productivity, for our health, and for going to the next slide. There we go. It aids in evangelism. The God who saves is the same God who keeps. Now, that word keep is going to come up several times. We we experienced it last week. What does keep mean? We read about keep my commandments. We want assurance of our salvation. You will. One of those was the test of what you do. You keep your commandments. Remember, we used the example of the, it's a, it's a Greek word that talks about navigation. And, and it's aligning the stars so you'll know you're heading in the right direction. Well, the God who saves is the same God who keeps. In this, in this case, rather than, than us keeping in line with God's commandments, what this is talking about here is that God keeps our security in his hand. He, he is faithful to secure us. We're to keep our eye on him. He's going to keep his hand on us. So it aids in evangelism. When we know that we're secure in our faith, when we know that God is secure in his promise to us, then we can be a participant in eternal security. You must be a believer who partakes of the divine nature, heaven born, before heaven, therefore heaven bound, had a new birth, who is genuinely a child of God. That's That describes a, a believer, okay? You have a new nature because Christ lives in you through the presence of the Holy Spirit. You're heaven born, therefore heaven bound. My ticket to heaven, if you would, if you would, is because we were born of the Father. All right. In Matthew 7, 22, 23, it actually talks about you were <coughs> you were religious, but you were never you were never saved. And I, let's see if I can read that real quick. Uh, Matthew 7, 22, and for those of you in the uh, 
You got it. Yeah, if you've got it, read it. Yeah. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So, so here he, he's, he's saying, and this is in the Sermon on the Mount, when, when the Sermon is describing this new kingdom uh, with its rules and who with the characteristics of the, of the citizens and, and what this kingdom was supposed to be about. He puts this verse in there. There will be many that will come say, Lord, Lord. He said, Open the door. Let me in. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Well, wait a minute. I did a lot of churchy things. I've got a I've got a whole breast full of, of, of pins that said I went to Sunday school for 30 years in a row. We used to do that. Sean has things as you know, Sunday school attendance and some of you years ago. You remember? You know, you got a little class for one year, two years, three years. If you hadn't missed a Sunday, it's kind of like that. perfect attendance in school. You recognize them. We used to do that. Did see? Don't I have three years of pins? Depart from me, for I never knew you. Those are the words that no one is going to want to hear. So, we want to look at that. They were religious, but never saved. If they're saved, fear. If they're saved, they will never perish. That's what Jesus promised. If you're a believer, you'll never perish. My sheep will never perish. Okay? It goes on to say, those fall away, we're never truly saved to start with. The whole bottom thing, when you go to John 1-9, we're not going to read it. 2-19 speaks of those who some say they've lost their salvation. John rebukes that idea, and he says in 2-19, they were not of us. They said they were of us. John says, no, they were never of us. What was he talking about? Did they used to go to Hillside Baptist Church? Yeah. But they were never a child of God. It isn't important to be a member of Hillside Baptist Church. It's important to be a child of God. And so you have to have it. The faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. That's one of those little sayings you can kind of put in here that has all those F's in it. Okay? The faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. What's the flaw? Didn't truly believe. Didn't truly believe. And listen, this thing about this is the thing about acknowledging true belief. That's a personal thing. You can't tell by looking at me, and I can't tell by looking at you. God can tell. By looking at both of us. Who believes? Who doesn't? It's that relationship with him that counts, not that relationship with me. It's that relationship with him that counts, not that relationship here. If we have the right relationship here, we'll have the right relationship here. And so... Keep that in mind. That's that's a part of this. What we ought to what we ought to know. Okay. And I and I will wrap that one up with. You know, it's, it's Shauna's story to tell. I thought I knew my wife when I got married. She was a better church person than I was. Mm -hmm. no, I'm saying a lot, but she's a better church person than I was. She was baptized when she was 11. Sharon Baptist Church. I'll never forget the night. She came in and said, Jim, I don't think I'm saved. 
What was the key to that? Someone that I thought was on as solid a rock as anybody could be on said, I think if the doubt is to the point that from that standpoint, she was never saved. She came back in and made a public profession of faith, was baptized again. Later, has she been taken to the woods yet a time or two? Yeah. Her salvation was flawed from the beginning. Not, be, not necessarily because of age. There are young people that are saved. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not saying that. It's not about age. It's about what was the motive at the beginning? What was the uh, what was the circumstances at the beginning? Was there was there a real personal decision made? Nobody can judge that. But God and that person blew my mind away. That's her testimony. That's hers to tell. But uh, but just just know that there's a there's a promise there that uh, that we want to claim. Romans eight thirty eight to thirty nine. Let's get that. If somebody has it, you can read it. I'm having the trouble here. I just I need that. <laughs> this this we'll we'll get it. We'll get it. <clears throat> Romans uh, 8, 38 to 39. And it's gonna say, uh, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Paul's writing to the Romans. They weren't necessarily Jews, but he was writing to Romans, the Roman believers, and Paul says, I'm convinced. And Paul was a smart guy. And he took God to the full test. And God had to really take him to the woodshed. But he writes, I am convinced nothing created, no kind of force, no kind of power, can what? Be able to separate us from the love of God. If Satan can't come up, and who was Satan? He was the archangel that wanted to be like God. He was in the presence of God. He took a third, when he was cast out of heaven, he took a third of the angels with him uh, out of heaven. Even angels in heaven were cast out from the power, by the power of God. If Satan, with that status, stature, and, and, uh, and, and background, cannot pry me out of God's hand. Nothing else can. Nothing else can. We need to take confident, secure, confident comfort in knowing we're that secure. No, no, uh, no force or strength is going to be going to be strong enough to do that. So, I'm punching buttons here. Oh, I can't get to the right one. Here it is. Not to that one. Let's don't do that one. Let's do that one. Now, how do I get rid of that one? <laughs> <laughs> hey, how'd I do? You got rid of it. And when all else, <laughs> when all else fails, thank you, Rob. <laughs> When all else fails. Let me look up Philippians 1 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He's so good. He 
easy getting here. There, there we go. God is our convictor, our converter, and our completer. What does one six say? Being confident of this very thing that he who begun, he who began a good work in you will complete it. Okay. Until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul again is writing, yeah, he's writing to the Philippian church. And, and the church of at Philippi was a church filled with with uh, uh, veterans of uh, of the Roman legions. It was one of those conquered cities. And because they won great battles for the emperor when they retired, he gave them land. And, and Philippi, the city of Philippi, was filled with these Roman patriots. They were, you know, this is like living in a vet village there. You know, that, that, that's kind of what it was. And they were staunch for, for the Roman way of life. They weren't Jews by any stretch of the imagination. And so they have they have founded a church there. They had great problems getting in getting inroads into there. There was where the Philippian jailer, remember the story of the Philippian jailer, uh, was all going to kill himself because he knew that that was the penalty for a for a guard at the jail to let somebody escape. And and here Paul and his friend were in there and they didn't try to escape. Because he knew that, oh my goodness, the jail doors are open. I, somebody escapes. That's that's a penalty of death for the jailer. So it was a hard place to witness. It was a hard place to share the gospel. These were hardcore people. And here's what Paul writes back to them. He's encouraging these new believers in that kind of environment. And he goes back and he says, For I am confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect or complete it until the day of Christ. That's Christ coming to, to pull his church, to take his church out. He'll, he'll, he'll complete that work in you. So what, what God starts, he will finish. We can be confident in that. And then I put some other, some other references there uh, about how he does that through through convicting him of our sin, so we know we have to confess it to stay pure in front of God, and then He is the converter who who opens our understanding, who helps us to see what the Holy Spirit is doing in us, and then He's a completer, and and He's the one that finishes that work. And you'll hear that uh, uh, you'll hear that discussed lots of times about uh, about a work being done, and I'll let clicker over there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. And, and God is sovereign in his, in his predestination. Uh, the believer is, is predestined to be like Jesus. That is said. He sees you already glorified in heaven because we are living in history he lives above and beyond history. You and I see things finite. That's a curse, if I can use that word, of being human. Our mind can only see and absorb so much. We live in the present. We live in this temporal time. We, we're, we see based on those restrictions. God does not. He saw from the beginning he sees through to eternity. He lives in us by virtue of the presence of his spirit, and, and he's working through eternity. And so he sees beyond our history. So predestination is a big is a big churchy word sometimes. Boy, you get people really fighting about, about all kinds of predestination things. Uh, but the important thing about predestination is we understand it's a God characteristic. He knew from the beginning. He knows till the end. I can only see a certain frame. 
He's three, he sees 360, 100 miles back and 100 miles ahead. All the time. He knows the future. So we were predestined for, to believe in Christ then puts us in that eternity element of God beyond what I'm able to see. Jesus hung on the cross one time for all time. Now that goes back to what I just said about the, the predestination of God. This, this sacrifice, what, what were the Jews having to do up to this time? Every year they met. Every year they had a single day of atonement. It's all based on what God told them to do back in the Old Testament. There's going to come one time a year you're going to have to sacrifice that pure, pure sacrificial lamb to, to absorb the sins of this nation and keep yourself in right standing with God. And that's what they had to do. Well, guess what? Friday, it came on the day of Passover, it came on the day that they celebrated putting shed blood over the door mantle so that the firstborn of the, of the sons of Israel would not die when the death angel came in the, in the tenth plague of the, of the uh, Egyptian uh, event, and, and, that, and, that, uh, uh, and that shedding of that blood, and, it, and, and they blew a trumpet at three o'clock in the afternoon on that day, and guess what, Jesus died on that day, the day that was set for that atonement to be made, and at three o'clock, the trumpeter on the on the rim of the uh, of the tabernacle uh, complex blew the trumpet to let all of the people know that that sacrificial lamb has been slain, and the blood was taken before the altar, the altar being inside the Holy of Holies. And that day of atonement, that, that Passover celebration that they were required to observe was done. What was different about it? It was the last time it was ever required because Christ hung on the cross. And it was at that, it was at that, at that three o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour, that he gave up the ghost to say and cried, it is finished. The work had been complete. The promise, the, the, the requirement was finished. He only did it one time. You don't have to do it again. There's some more passages of scripture up there. Again, I'm going to start bringing those for you so you can follow up with that if you want to. Uh, and, and, uh, and you know that Calvary is important to us because that is uh, that is the perfect sacrifice that's required. It gives us a new position. We're saved as a new creation in Christ. Um, Jesus would have to lose his relationship with the Father, and that's not going to happen for us to be doing all this other thing. I put up here archaeology. Art meaning the, the key word there. Uh, archaeology. What happened in the ark? God was distraught. He's going to wipe the people off the earth. He goes to Noah. He tells Noah to build an ark. Uh, what happens in that ark? It was over, over 100 years estimated that it took to have to build this thing. It's huge. They, they rub tar and stuff over it. They bring in the animals and then we get the, gather the provisions. And it's him and his three sons and they're Three wives, so it's, it's uh, 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 Noah, his wife, three sons, their wives, and all these animals, and it begins to rain. And God seals the ark. He seals the ark. He stopped the floodwaters from being able to get inside the ark. So that those that were in the ark at the time that this event happened were safe 
They were secure. It's a picture of what happens to us. When we accept Christ as our Savior, He seals us. Not only could the floodwaters not get in, nothing else could get in either. The opportunity to get into that ark was passed. And God seals it. He, if you would, that ark becomes like the hand of God. Once he seals it, he closes it, and it's secure. You know, there's no ringtone camera out there. You don't have to worry about it. Nobody's going to break in. Nobody's going to take it. Uh, so, so we go through that. I put down there at the bottom, security is not a place. <clears throat> if we think, well, now I'm going to heaven, and that's, I'm secure. Uh, it, it's, it's not a place. Security is not a place. What's secure is the hand of God. Understand, even angels were eliminated from heaven. It's not the place. It's the presence of God. All right? So, uh, we're going to move on through this. I'm going to brush through a couple of these. Get out of there. So we have an eternal provision. There's another verse. You get eternal life the moment you believe in Christ, not when you leave this temporal life. So let's don't think about it in terms of I've got something waiting for me after that's going to be I've never had before. You've got it right now. You've got it right now. And even Jesus goes on to say he prays for those sheep that have been given to him. We have we have Christ praying for us. That's a, that's a tremendous thought. He talks about it in Hebrews 7. And in Hebrews, of course, you're writing to the Jews there to impress upon them what they have. So it's God's power. We're kept by God's power. It's not a matter of us holding on to him. It's a matter of him holding on to us. It's not what I do. It's what he does for us. Uh, eternal security is not a license to sin. God will take you to the to the woodshed again. Hebrews 12, 6. He quotes Proverbs, is what he's quoting in that passage. And the devil has deceptive power to entice and tempt, but he does not have the power to pry open the hand of God in whom the believer rests. You got that picture. Uh, so we've got we need to believe the truth of the scripture as our foundation. We need to believe in the, in the salvation that God has granted to us so we can have assurance and peace. And we need to believe that, uh, that we have an eternal security. An eternal security. And that's God's security. So that we don't have to be concerned. We, we, we're free. What it does is it frees us up to do the work. We're not worried about trying to accomplish something that, how many of us in our retirement look forward to, okay, I've got to prepare for retirement. I've got to, I've got to set things aside. I've got to finish certain projects. I have to get certain things done. Well, eternity is not a retirement. Eternity is set for us. We don't have to do anything to prepare for it. There's no checklist of things except to surrender our lives to Christ. Once that's done, it's a sure thing. So we need to have that as a firm belief with this. Got questions, comments, concerns, issues? Nothing. No word of prayer. Father, we just uh, thank you for 
this opportunity.